Thanks, Matt. It's uh, great to be here. Um, so the, the FBI estimate that in the last uh, three years, $26 billion have been lost due to business email compromise attacks. Uh, BC attacks is kind of a catch-all fuzzy word for essentially any attack on email. So this could be phishing, spear phishing, compromised uh, accounts, etc. So we all know that uh, email is the um, most widely used communication platform in the world, but it certainly has its weaknesses. Uh, it's open by design, meaning that you can send an email to literally anyone in the world and it will most likely be delivered. Um, legacy systems are rule-based predominantly, so attackers are just constantly thinking, how can we reverse engineer these rules to bypass your existing defenses? And attacks are cheap to do, they're effective, and they can be performed from anywhere in the world. So to demonstrate these three points, I'm going to walk you through three examples of some real-world uh, spear phishing emails that we've seen at Tessian. But I'm specifically going to talk about, kind of from the attacker's point of view, how they are thinking about navigating past these existing legacy rules. So every spear phishing email kind of has three common components. There's the target, the person you want to attack, the person you want to get to do something. In our case, it's Laura Smith, CFO at SoBank. And then there's someone the attacker wants to impersonate, so someone they want to pretend to be. And this is often someone that is trusted by the target, and they're known by the target, and we're going to use a kind of fictional uh, external law firm to SoBank to, for the purposes of this demo. And then, of course, as an attacker, they're orchestrating everything. They have an outcome in mind, and this is going to be to steal money from SoBank. So with social media and search engines, it's just very easy to do that. Now it's just very easy to do a lot of in-depth um, research into your target and the person you're impersonating. So things like press releases accidentally expose external counterparties that a company has just work with, worked with on a recent project. So this would be a great person, for example, to go and impersonate. Uh, and then things like LinkedIn allow you to just go really deep on the person you're targeting or the person you're impersonating to build a really compelling email attack. So the first example I'm going to show you is by far the most simple. Uh, however, it's very effective. Uh, and essentially, it's just changing the display name of a, sender's, of a sender. And the display name is literally the name, not the email address. So it's, it's the name of the sender. And the rule that I'm looking to break here as an attacker um, is I know that legacy tools are looking for impersonations of people within your organization. They're not looking for impersonations of your external counterparties, your supply chain, etc. So here you can see an email um, that Laura Smith has received, the CFO, and it only says it's come from Tom Adams. This took me 10 seconds to change the sender's display name. Um, but you'll notice that this is viewed on a mobile device, and there's huge uh, security vulnerabilities in nearly all mobile email clients that they don't actually display the sender's email address. So this is all Laura sees on her mobile. She just sees Tom Adams, someone she trusts, someone she talks to daily. Uh, and actually, the only way that Laura could find out that there's something unusual about this email is if she clicked on Tom Adams on, on the name. And here you can see that there is indeed an unusual sender. Um, now, that's quite an unlikely action to take, especially if you are trusting of this person. There's nothing, you know, they would often be talking about paying invoices, et cetera. Um, and actually, what I've done here, you, you won't be able to see, but I've sent this in the evening. So I've sent it at 9 p.m. when I'm pretty confident Laura is going to be away from her desk. She's going to be on her mobile device. I don't want her to be able to see the sender's email address. I just want her to see the display name. So that was the first very simple attack, but it's pretty effective and it's used all the time. Uh, essentially changing the display name to an external counterparty, not someone within your organization. So now we're going to kind of ramp it up a little bit. Um, and now we're going to do something a bit more advanced. Rather than asking for a request of money on the originating email, we're actually going to try and steal Laura's email credentials. Um, and the rule that I'm looking to break here is I know that legacy tools are looking within the email body for essentially exact matches against a list of well-known services that are commonly impersonated. So Microsoft, Dropbox, these are services that get impersonated all the time in spear phishing attacks. 
So here you can see Laura has received an email from Microsoft saying that she's got a message that's quarantined. This is exactly what Microsoft emails look like. Laura will see these multiple times a week. There's nothing really unusual. In fact, the only thing that is unusual here is that the domain is maybe unusual. But I've chosen a generic sounding domain. It's one that mimics some patterns used by some email providers. So things like messaging, outbound, these are things that people associate with email. There's nothing too unusual about this. But also if we look at in the body of the email, you can see that there is actually a reference to Microsoft here. So legacy tools might actually be able to see that this could be trying to impersonate Microsoft. But when we look at the raw HTML behind this, just this sentence, we can see some unusual things going on. And firstly, you can see a lot of instances of the phrase Laura Smith. Now, this isn't unusual to a legacy security system. In fact, the recipient is Laura Smith. It's probably expected. But when we go and look at the sentence again, you can see that Laura Smith is not present there. And there's a reason for that is uh, there's a CSS class that's essentially telling the mail client to hide all of those instances of Laura Smith. And even more worryingly, we can see some characters that are not hidden. These don't have the CSS class applied. You can see M, I, C. And obviously, all of these characters combined spells Microsoft. And that's exactly what is displayed in this email. Now, as an attacker, why I've done this is I know that legacy systems are looking for Microsoft in the email. They're looking for Microsoft in the plain text and in the HTML of the email. But as I've just demonstrated, there is no match um, for Microsoft in this email. There's just an M and then lots of random HTML. There's an I, lots of random HTML. And I know as an attacker, this is just going to fly past all legacy systems looking for services impersonation. So Laura sees that the message that's being held has been sent from Tom. She clicks, uh, yep, I want to receive this. I want to unquarantine this email. She clicks the link. She gets taken to this fake but very authentic looking Microsoft authentication page. She enters her email address and password and has accidentally given me, the attacker, full access to her email. So what I do with those credentials is that I now just log into Laura's email account and I send an email to a distribution group called SO Bank's suppliers list. And I've gone and said that uh, we've changed our bank details. To all my suppliers, please could you update your automated payment systems? And as an attacker, all I'm doing is hoping that just a couple of these suppliers make the change. And that could be a huge sum of money for me. So the third and final example that I'm going to walk you through are going to use some social engineering techniques to send an even more compelling um, attack. And again, the rule that I'm looking to break here is that I know that legacy systems uh, rely heavily on email authentication checks. So they are looking for if email authentication passes or fails, they will use a rule to work out whether to deliver or block the email. So we've, men we've heard uh, DMARC mentioned uh, just earlier by CAF, but DMARC is essentially an email authentication protocol that tells the world who is allowed or what service is allowed to send email on behalf of a domain. So this is to stop against brand forgery, people sending emails on behalf of your domain. Now, you would think that the majority of companies have set their DMARC records correctly, but unfortunately, only 15% of all Fortune 500 companies have done this. That means the other 85% are just open to having their domain um, impersonated and their, and their brand um, forged. So as an attacker, when I'm thinking about attacking SoBank, all I need to do is go through a list of external counterparties that maybe I've discovered through press releases to find out who I want to go and impersonate. And the easy pickings are the companies who have not published their DMARC records. So thankfully, for the purpose of this demo, uh, the law firm that I introduced at the beginning have not uh, published their DMARC records. This is a public tool. It's free to use. It's very easy to work out whether um, any company has set their DMARC record correctly. So because it's social engineering, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go after the person I'm impersonating, and I'm going to look at their social media channels. And what I'm doing here is I'm looking for any interesting posts that I can make use of for a future um, email, spear phishing email attack that will just give it authenticity. So here I find an email, uh, sorry, uh, uh, a Twitter, a tweet saying um, that Tom is presenting at Money 2020. This is great for me as an attacker. 
Now I can do one step, I can go one step even further, and I can actually know when Tom lands in the US. And how I do that is I essentially send Tom an email. And this email can essentially be about anything. It can be sent by anyone. Um, well, it's sent by me, but I can make it look like it's sent from anyone. Uh, and all I want is Tom to open this email. And that's because I've put an invisible tracking pixel within the email that essentially when Tom opens up his mail client, it makes a remote request to my web server to download this pixel. And what I can do is write a quick script that essentially as soon as Tom opens this email, I can do an IP location look, look up and find exactly from where he's just looked at that, um, that email. So as you can see on this feed, it comes up and it says that Tom has in fact landed in the US. And why that's important to me as an attacker is I want to attack Laura impersonating Tom when Tom is out of the country, when he's busy, when he's not going to be by his phone, when you can't just quickly check whether like, an invoice that needs to be paid is correct or not. I want to get Tom when he's busy, he's out of the country. So now I've confirmed that Tom is in the US. I'm going to send Laura a really um, authentic, compelling spear phishing email. And here, you can notice that it's from the exact domain, dorlingclayton.com, because I know that they don't have email authentication set up. I know that I'm just allowed to send emails on behalf of this domain, and it will get past legacy systems. I've referenced the fact that I'm talking at Money 2020. Um, I can only assume that Laura will know this. They're close. They work together on a weekly basis. So this gives authenticity to the email. I've also sprinkled in a bit of urgency, which is a proven technique to get a target, which makes a target much more likely to take action on an email. So I've said things like urgent request, please can you transfer this money? So what do these three attacks tell us? Well, they tell us that email is open by design and that attackers are only going to just keep taking advantage of this. That rule-based systems are there to be broken. They're going to constantly be reverse engineering any rule that you put in place, any static rule. And these email attacks are just really compelling. You can't expect all your people to be security experts. $26 billion is obviously a huge amount of money. There's just so much up for grabs for attackers at the moment. Every successful phishing, uh, spear phishing email costs businesses, on average, $1.6 million. And with numbers like these, it's hardly surprising that phishing attacks are on the rise. I've shown you today in this presentation just three attacks, but 135 million phishing emails are sent every single day. So what does this mean for you and your organization? Well, you should think about tackling, making tackling spear phishing a priority. You need to protect your people. You can't expect them to be right and spot everything 100% of the time. And attackers will always find ways to break the rules. Every spear phishing email leaves behind a digital fingerprint. And machine learning has enabled a new generation of security companies to be able to spot these subtle anomalies and stop the most advanced attacks. Thank you very much.